Welcome to the club! This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. What is leverage? It's a strategic advantage. It's the power to act effectively. It means you're bringing something to the table more than the what ifs, more than potential. You're bringing a reputation. You're bringing some business, and that they want. They want it more than you. Than uh, they need you more than you need them. That's why we called it the Climb. It's an acronym. It stands for Creating Leverage in the Music Business. Brilliant. Uh, the genius that came up with that, Mr. Wordman, and my co-host and good friend is Mr. Brent Baxter. Brent is an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Antebellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And what I love about Brent is he helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you write like a pro, do business like a pro, and then, gosh darn it, he'll put you in front of the pros. Mm -hmm. He can make sure you get in touch with him. You can find Brent at songwritingpro.com. It's a lot of pros. Songwritingpro.com. <laughs> And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Duanell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They help you find your sound, and they help you grow your audience so you can become the artist that everybody loves, and so you can get paid. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists such as Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That's production, singular, no S. There is no S because there is no other Johnny D. What's up, man? What's up, brother? How you doing? I'm doing well. Good, man. Good to see you again. We're, we're in the same room again. We are in the same room again, yes. I love that. And we have a special guest like on this show. Like a little campfire. It's, it is gather like around. It yes. Is. Gather around, yeah. We have a special guest on this show. We're going to be interviewing uh, a lawyer music attorney extraordinaire, Mr. Jeremy Brook from Brook Law Firm. But uh, before we get to And there that, is no S. And there is no S and there is it's no E. Exactly. It's just Brook. Brook. Like a battling Brook. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but first of all, let's take care of a, a, a little bit of business here. The Climb Podcast is proud to partner with Disc Makers, who have been supporting indie musicians before indie music was even a thing. And whenever you're ready to make your CDs, DVDs, or print up some vinyl, which we're going to be doing with the Lonely Highway Boys, mm -hmm. it's a very special thing. Or if you want to distribute your music and videos with customized USBs, Go to discmakers.com. That's D I S C makers.com. And that's the only place you need to go. That's right. And while you're there, click the Guides and Resources tab and download some of their excellent free guides. They've just revised and expanded their home studio handbook, which has a ton of great advice and information for newbies and for studio veterans. You can find them online at www.discmakers.com or give them a call at 800 468 9353. Again, that's 800 Four six eight nine three five three. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. So hey, uh, real quick, if you haven't joined the climb community, please do so. We let everybody in. Uh, you got to have a picture. Yes. By your, you know, like you got to have a picture. You don't have to be hot. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. We don't judge. <laughs> you don't, yeah, it doesn't have to be a picture of you, but it's got to be a picture. We can't right. have the Let's, silhouette there. Yes. Uh, we'll let everybody in, and there's some good stuff going on there, man. Some yes. good. Some good um, interactions going on. Mm -hmm. People helping people are the most wonderful people yes a little bit of people yelling at people that's, that's yeah, that, a little bit of that happened a little bit of that. <laughs> but this is where <laughs> actually we took the comp the the questions that you most wanted to ask uh the the legal questions that we're going to field to jeremy live here on the show so if you haven't done that please do so and uh, just be good boys and girls or you mm -hmm. will be roadhouse um Subscribe to the podcast, whatever podcast player you're using. That just makes sure that all the episodes on Tuesday come automatically into your phone mm -hmm. and the mini-sodes on Friday, and they're in the proper order, and you can consume them as you wish. But At you don't your have to go chase them down. That's right. At your leisure. And then uh, leave a rating and review. Take five seconds, do that. That uh, Anybody that's kind of sticking their toe in the water to see if mm -hmm. they're legit or not is going to look at those and... and you know, see if that's worth the juice is worth the squeeze. That's right. And then finally, the best compliment you give us is share it, man. If this is working for you, please tell a friend. If, if mm -hmm. they're finding value in this podcast and the content here, then somebody from your band, another songwriter, another musician that you know, it's it's going to be helped as well. We're trying to. We want you to win. That's why the podcast exists. So we got a reputation. You know, do us a favor and spread it around. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, man, welcome. Mr. Jeremy Brook. Thanks, Welcome. guys. Glad to be here. <laughs> That's right. We're, uh, I, we met Jeremy here at the uh, Fort Knox, the mm -hmm. thriving uh, music ecosystem, man. It's like a beehive, a coolness. Mm -hmm. and in order to be in this building, you've got to be uh, 
you, you got to be somehow orbiting around the music business, which is cool. So, right. um, we Jeremy was right down the hall, and we just ended up having some great conversations since uh, oh, since we got to meet. And uh, I'm very thankful for the connections that you've provided us. So, uh, thank you for that, sir. That's my pleasure. Um, but we had uh, we we kind of put up a uh, a graphic and and just asked everybody in the community, what are the what do you want to know? What's mm-hmm. been bugging you about about the legal system and we got a lot of stuff to cover, so we're going to dig right into and it. And I'll be honest, we're not going to cover any of the Supreme Court nomination stuff. No, we're not going to. Uh, <laughs> those questions, while valid, and we respect that, Everybody's gonna pull we're it. not going to touch that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what do you want to handle first? I'll ask you. Um, you know, let's take that that concept of when should an artist form an entity or should an artist form an entity okay. or a songwriter, uh, you know, whoever you may be. Uh, in the in the industry, um, and so the you know a lot of a lot of aspiring artists and songwriters have questions about should they form an LLC, should they form a corporation, should they uh, just be a sole proprietor, mm-hmm. and at, at what point should they form an entity? So my my answer to this is generally yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is awesome, and, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and here's your bill. That's right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, worth every penny. Right. So. so uh, there's a bit of a cost-benefit analysis to this. I favor forming an entity earlier rather than later. If you're in Tennessee uh, to form a corporation, it's $100. To form an LLC, it's 300 Most states are somewhere around there. Basically, you can consider that kind of like paying for insurance. It's the price you pay to have some liability protection. To and cover your assets. Exactly, yeah. to cover your assets. And what, what these entities do is they... Uh, they keep you from being personally liable for uh, the the potential liability that your business may run into. And, you know, if you're an artist or a songwriter, that's going to largely be copyright infringement or contractual mm-hmm. liability. Um, if you're a touring artist, then there's all kinds of trouble you can get into on the road. The, the van crashes or, oh, you know, some of the there's, stage got, collapses. Yeah, uh, stage collapses. There's yeah. pyrotechnics that go wrong. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So for uh, artists that can afford it, a lot of times I'll actually recommend two separate entities, one for touring and one for everything else. So that you know, not only can they not get to your personal assets, to your house and your car and all that stuff, but um, if you if something goes wrong while you're on tour, all they get to is the assets of the touring entity and not everything else, all the masters and uh, compositions that you may own that may be in the, the other. The revenue way. streams that are created it's, outside of touring exactly. are kept separate exactly. and protected. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so um, almost 100% of the time I recommend an LLC over a corporation. You get exactly the same liability protection uh, from each of those entity types, but the difference is corporations are fairly rigid. And if you don't comply with the formalities of a corporation, having a board of directors, mm-hmm. having annual meetings, having bylaws, if you don't do all and that minutes, stuff. And minutes, like minutes? Minutes. You yeah. come up with yeah. minutes. Which are, which are exactly. notes of the meetings. Yes. Yeah. So you got to prove that they happen. Yeah. Yep. I know this yep. because I was like secretary of like beta club or something, I think, <laughs> yeah. one time yeah. in high school. Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> call the notes minutes. Yeah, that's right. Very <laughs> fancy. All, oh, wait, all, sorry. All I'll be the everyman in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that word means. <laughs> That's right. So if you don't do these things and you get sued, then an enterprising plaintiff's lawyer is going to say, Your Honor, they didn't comply with the corporate formalities. We're going to pierce the corporate veil. We can go after their house and their car and, and yeah. their trophy collection and all that. Just because you say your corporation does not make you Correct. up. You don't act like that's, one that's through right. all the stuff. That's right. can... And the same is true of LLCs, but LLCs are way more flexible. It's basically a hybrid of partnerships and corporations. So it's the best of both worlds. So... You know, it's a difference in like somebody saying, "Okay, you need to write me a song. It needs to be in C major. It needs to be a love song. It needs to have four verses and a bridge that is no more than sixteen seconds long." Home sweet home, Motley Crue. Bingo. <laughs> That's a C major. Okay. Bingo. <laughs> Tommy doesn't want to mess right. with those black right. Like he doesn't. So, it's a little complicated. <laughs> Right, so that song is a corporation, uh-huh. whereas somebody else comes to you and says, write me a love song, it just has to be um, about two people who are falling in love in middle America, and that's it. And that's 
an LLC. So you have a few things that you have to comply with, but within that framework, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why LLCs are are generally better because it's much harder to pierce that liability shield. Wow. Um, So, you know, particularly with artist clients who aren't always, you know, the best at dotting the I's and crossing the T's when it comes to business stuff because they're too busy writing songs and, you know, mm-hmm. honing their chops on, on their instruments or, you know, being out on the road or whatever. We don't have to worry about having that annual meeting and the board of directors and the minutes and, right. you know, all that other stuff that you got to do with corporations. Just go do your thing. That's right. That's right. And, and you can have an LLC as a as a solo sure. preneur, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you okay. can be a single member LLC or a single shareholder corporation. Um, and this is where these concepts are actually even more important because, Courts are going to make sure that that entity, whether it's an LLC or a corporation, is not uh, an alter ego. That's the term the courts actually use. So they mm. they want to make sure it's not an alter ego for you, that it's actually a separate legal entity, um, which it is as long as you treat it that way. The most important thing is keep the money separate. Don't commingle money. If you've got an entity, whether it's an LLC, corporation, or, or even a, a partnership, Keep the money separate. Don't pay your rent from the coffers of the entity. Um, you know, don't be buying your groceries with the money from the which company. is really easy to do if oh, you're yeah. like the single. If you're a single person Owner, LLC, yeah. uh, it's your money. Yeah, you can do whatever you want with yeah. it, but yeah. you gotta like put it through the right freaking channel. Yeah. Or yeah. I gotta have two bank accounts or what, possibly, and then. Pay goes into this, even if it's your only source of income. I got to maybe move it over to my personal pay me, right? And then I pay my groceries exactly. out of that separate checking account or exactly. whatever. And because I'll tell you what, stuff, there's, yeah. there's the like, like you're like, but I'm I, at, I'm at, I need something for work, and here at this personal at the same place, I got to go. I got to do this twice. <laughs> I got two yeah. baskets. Yeah. Let me pay separately. It's the it's the, the lady at Walmart looks at you. <laughs> You're like I'm a business owner. That's right. That's right. right. It's a trade off you get for the liability protection. Exactly. That's yeah. right. Otherwise, I mean, straight up, you're you're in like Tennessee. It, it's a you got to pay a little bit every year to mm-hmm. keep that yes. going, and you're spending that money for no protection if mm-hmm. you're commingling yeah. the funds. Yeah, you know, yeah like. that, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> so, you, yeah, you have to pay that same fee every year for your annual report. Yeah. And I should also... You can pay for the birth control, but if you don't take if the birth control, it's not doing you any good. It's right. not doing you any good. Yep. Right. Um, and, you know, there may be tax consequences to you know, forming an entity. And, you know, everyone should tax, talk to their own tax advisor um, to, you know, figure those things out. Um but you know, by and large, uh, to my mind, as an attorney, you know, who's looking out for the pitfalls that my clients may be walking into, um, you know, having that entity formed earlier rather than later is always better. You mm-hmm. know, if you can afford a few hundred bucks to put that in place, it's gonna it's gonna help. It's gonna serve you well. There you go. Um, so we had a question on lyrics and on specifically. First of all, if you ch- if you take a popular song and um, you change some of the words to a familiar tune, but you're not doing it tongue in cheek, it's not a it's a, not a weird al, a, not a, a weird al Yankovic thing. It's not supposed to be a parody, right? Isn't it still what's it, is that still a parody though? Considered a parody? No, or does no. parody mean it's funny or supposed to be funny? Well, parody means it's it's funny and it's um, you are poking fun at the work itself. So there's a distinction between parody and satire that okay. the Supreme Court has drawn. And parody is generally considered to be fair use. So if you create a parody, uh, in many cases, it's not going to be copyright infringement, even if you don't have a license to do it, because it's it's going to be fair use. Now, that's not 100% certainty, but generally that is the And case. you still have to pay. It's not like you get free song, right? You still have to pay, because they still have writer and publisher, the original creator. Well, right? so that's... Uh, I mean, the idea behind creating a parody is you can do it without, uh, or I I should say the idea behind fair use is Mm -hmm. you can do this thing that is considered fair use without having a license to do it. Now, Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of best practices, a lot of times people do go out and get the licenses because it's just going to be safer and, you know, you may end up paying a little more um, up front, but you're going to save yourself the possibility of getting sued for 
infringement, even if you win that infringement claim because of a, a successful fair use defense. But you still it, lose. Yes, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, pain and, and suffering. Yeah, and the idea behind fair use is it's a defense to copyright infringement. So somebody says, "Hey, you you took my song and you made a joke out of it. I'm suing you for copyright infringement because you didn't get a license. You didn't ask me first. Mm-hmm. And the idea is you can go into court and you can say, well, this is not copyright infringement, even though, yes, I took their song and I changed it and I you know, made it my own. And I did not have permission to do that, but it is not copyright infringement because it's fair use. Mm-hmm. So it's a defense to that. Um, and the distinction between parody and satire is that you know, satire, you are taking the song that somebody wrote and you're making some commentary on society or politics or whatever it may be and you're not really commenting on the song itself mm-hmm. but what weird al does is he you know essentially comments on the song itself by mm-hmm. you know sort of turning it on its head and mm-hmm. um, and and cops the, like as much as you can the arrangements and everything to try to make it sound like mm-hmm. the original it's not even like a yeah. cover song it, it it's Yes. So th- so we were talking about this before. So so how does that like how does that work without Zal become a new writer on that song? I mean, he did Fat instead of Michael Jackson's right. Bad. Cuz mm-hmm. I'm fat, I'm fat. You know, ham right. on it. Like like this how does that how does that work? Yeah, so he'll have he'll have a copyright interest in the new part that he created. The new arrangement, the new lyrics, then the revenue that that generates. Yes, yeah. And so basically, you know, you kind of look at it like co-authors of the new song. So mm-hmm. Michael Jackson is still going to be an author of Weird Al's song. Okay. Weird Al will not be an author of Bad. Right. Mm-hmm. But Michael Jackson will be one of the authors of Fat because that's the, the foundation of it. So um, you kind of partition off the the copyright interests in okay. um, Weird Al gets the new part and Michael Jackson keeps the old part and there's you know some kind of split there and that's another reason why it's a good idea to you know if you're doing something like this you know ask ahead of time try to get that license because then you can agree on what the split is just like you would if you were writing a song with somebody else and you don't end up fighting that um, you know, even like on. even I mean back in the weird Al days it was like a radio and so they're spending a boatload of money to to get that mm-hmm. art and that artist with the new twist mm-hmm. in front of new eyeballs, right? Yeah. And to let them know it exists. But now, you could do something like that and it could possibly do 100 million views on YouTube and generate a whole yeah. bunch of revenue yeah. and you don't want to be having that conversation afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's also important to point out here that the, you know there's a big difference in just taking a song that you know and, and just changing the lyric because you think it sounds better, but you're not actually parodying the song itself you're not mm-hmm. poking fun at the song you're just changing the lyrics or you know changing a chorus or whatever it may be mm-hmm. all you're doing there is creating a derivative work and that like, sweet home alabama ought to be sweet home arkansas yeah so i like exactly. that better so it's still exactly whatever. yeah exactly yeah um although some people would think that is a comedy song but that hurts me as an Arkansas. Well, no. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> on the other things. Yeah. But okay, so that'd be more of a derivative work. So still, Correct. it's a serious work. Yeah, that's right. And and that you would have to have a license from the copyright owner to do that. Okay. Um, and, and parody is not the only fair use defense. It's just the one that is kind of the most popular, the most people know about. But there are factors that the courts will look at to determine if something is fair use Mm -hmm. and there's basically four factors that they look at it's what's the impact on the market for the original work Uh, how much of the original work did you take Um, what's the nature of the use is it commercial is it not Um, and and none of these things are going to be uh, dispositive in and of themselves. No, none of them are going to be the one thing. Like you can't say, "Oh, this is for nonprofit, so therefore mm-hmm. it's fair use." They're going to look at the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you take if you take OJ's book mm-hmm. and you took the part where he says, you know, the part where he discusses if I did it, yeah, you know, that might be one paragraph or one page, but that's the whole value of that work. That's what everybody <laughs> wants to see. Right? That's what they're turning to. Right. right? So yeah. if you took that and and you publish that. Um, you know that might not be fair use, even though it's only one or two paragraphs, because that has a huge impact on the market for that book. Mm-hmm. So that's why all the factors are are kind of weighed. Together. Kind of that's the spoiler. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah, away. yeah. You might think of it as a spoiler. Like yeah. I'm giving away the. All I'm doing is giving away the last two minutes of the M Night Shyamalan. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right? That's all yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. And yeah. Bruce Willis is dead. What? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, this is one of those areas where like it's it's a it's a very gray area of law. It's yeah. heavily fact intensive. And you can't just say, oh, I'm doing this, and therefore it's fair use. Mm-hmm. Or I'm doing this, and therefore it's not fair use. Um, so it requires a lot of analysis, and it's, it's not always an easy thing to parse out. Okay. So um, so that question was from Nicole Lawrence, and then Bill Stanek uh, and Aaron Michael responded, and they want to ask about specifically parodies, the funny kind. Do they, so just to clarify, do they need permission from the original copyright holder to copyright and publish a derivative version if it is actually parody and um, all of the fair use factors you know worked out in their favor then no someone could get away with doing that without permission that said, because this is such a gray area of law and you don't have a guaranteed chance of of winning that fair use defense, mm-hmm. and even if you, even if you were arguing the fair use defense, it would still be expensive. Mm-hmm. It's a good idea to, to go and try to get a license, and you may be able to get a gratis license, meaning free, mm-hmm. or um, or a license for very cheap, because um, you know if the if the licensor or the copyright owner sees, yeah, this is parody, it's probably going to be considered fair use. So. You know, if, if if we try to bend them over a barrel for a licensing mm-hmm. fee here, and they just say no and walk, they still may be able to do this, and we can't do anything about it. Right. So, you know, you'd have some leverage probably to to work out a favorable fee. So a parody doesn't fall under, say, a compulsory license, which is after a song has been released the first time, you can't stop someone else from covering this song, but they do have to pay. Well, yeah, that, that's right. That's right. right because it's it's not a cover. Because right. you are creating a, a type of derivative work, meaning okay. you've changed the original work to, um, to become something new. Okay. And, and transformative is the concept that courts a lot of times look at in mm-hmm. fair use analysis. Did, did you actually do something that was transformative? Um, and so like that, you know, Sweet Home Arkansas, that's not, that's not transformative. Right. Fat is transformative. You've taken bad and you've turned it into something completely new mm-hmm. um, for a new purpose and and that requires permission. <clears throat> That's transformative things tend to be fair use. If okay, so let me ask you a question. Let's say I took um, U2's Bullet to Blue Sky. Great song. Great song, man. Killer song. And let's say I'm evil and I wanted to create like some kind of racist, you know, you know, bullet to gay guys or bullet to black guys or something like that. And I recorded it. And I put it out, and now, do they have, can they disallow that? It all depends on whether that's going to be considered parody and, and fair use. Okay. Um, it, so, as It's definitely transformative. Yes. Exactly. It definitely changes <laughs> yeah. what you two would have, you yeah. know, so much well, of what they would be about. Well, it's counterintuitive, right? Like it's to, counter what they would yeah. be about. I mean, right. as... as as distasteful as that is, and as reprehensible mm-hmm. as that is, that doesn't really matter when you're looking at whether it's parody um, and whether it's fair use. And essentially, you know, from a policy standpoint, what this all boils down to, the whole reason we have fair use is because there's a recognition that the nature of copyright is a restriction on free speech. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you don't have full unfettered rights to play my song that I wrote, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, a restriction on your free speech, Mm -hmm. right? So fair use is sort of to kind of bring back the balance of, well, in certain circumstances, you know, it is... I never uh, thought about it like that. Yeah, yeah. So so free speech weighs more heavily than the copyright interest does um, in those limited circumstances where fair use comes into play. So, you know, Johnny, in your example, um, as as terrible as that would be, yeah. uh, free speech might win out there. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, okay, guys. Well, I hope that uh, answers those questions there. And those are some good questions. Um, Tracy Lip 
uh, wants to know what the um, current legality of sync is when doing cover songs on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Um, he's working with people who do cover songs, and I know that we've straight up promoted that as a. I mean, n- number one on this podcast, we promoted yeah. it as a really good way to to get an audience if it's done correctly. And number two, um, I know that Daredevil has created twenty ish national television opportunities for artists by making them discoverable using cover songs on YouTube and and then more recently Facebook. But there was a while we couldn't do it on Facebook or they just yeah. take it down, they got a little Nazi on us. And mm-hmm. uh, but then they signed the deals and put the back end in place. So what's the le- the legality on that for a cover since we're on this subject? So this is one of those areas where like there's the the legal question and there's the practical question which doesn't entirely match up. I mean, the legal answer is, yeah, you need a sync license if you're going to put music to, you know, if you're going to sync it with an audiovisual recording, then, yeah, you need a sync license to do that. You know, the practical answer is these laws were written when it wasn't the case that millions of people could create videos. Twelve-year-old in the back yeah, of the car exactly. on the way home can... Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And so so the market has sort of struggled to keep up with, you know, how to deal with the round peg and the square hole problem. Um, I, I know that YouTube has negotiated deals with major publishers uh, to monetize uh, user-generated content and you know, not go after the, the lady who's, um, you know, Taking videos of her baby with music in the background and yeah. stuff like, or you know, or the the songwriters and artists who are who are doing covers, and mm-hmm. it's just user <clears throat> generated. They don't have those deals with everybody, so you know, if it's a major publisher, you're probably covered. But you know, if it's somebody that's uh, at a smaller uh, publishing company, that may not be the case. There's also companies like We Are The Hits that you can go to and sign up and uh, I think you upload your video and they will monetize it. They've basically done the deal for you. They'll monetize it and um, get you your revenue and the publishing company its revenue. So then then the writers are getting paid? Yes. I'm a fan. Yeah. Just want to say that. Sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we all like writers getting For a list of songs of mine you can cover. Yeah. For monetization, just go to. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. but, but there, I know that on the back end of Facebook, for instance, or no, on uh, YouTube, excuse me, on the back end of YouTube, I mean, there's a, you know, is this a cover? Like, there's buttons that you push, things that you click, and then, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that they're, they're discovering those writers and getting them paid, and there's going to be revenue from it. I mean, there are... There is a group of people, they call them YouTubers, who straight up, some of them make really good livings, mm-hmm. um, you know, big, fat, six-figure livings, and some even higher, doing really, really awesome cover songs, and they maybe they're put into a funny video or, or something like that, and, mm-hmm. and uh, they're able to do that because they're, they're picking a cover, that, and they're, 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 they're just masters of sorting, surfing, the wave of traffic, right? It's a new mm-hmm. song that comes out. They get on, they do it, and then it, it blows up because it's compelling in some form or fashion, mm-hmm. and 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 really uh, does something amazing. So those writers are getting paid uh, of the original work, mm-hmm. and and yeah. and there's some public. But you said it's the bigger publishers. It's not maybe the smaller publishers. Yeah, and some of the smaller publishers may have deals too. I mean, I, you know, I don't know the ins and outs of of all of YouTube's business on this front. But, you know, as a practical matter, you know, if you're uh, an artist and you're doing a cover of a song that you just want to throw up on YouTube, if you went to a major publisher and asked them directly for a sync license, they probably wouldn't even return your... Yeah, they're not... I mean, I've run into that with some independent artists before. They want to do a record, they want to cover some song, and they want to do it right. And God bless them for that. They're, They're calling it the publisher to try and get a license... Yeah, crickets. can't be bothered. Yeah. Crickets, and not that they want to cover crickets, but yeah, they just like you're not worth me picking up the phone mm-hmm. for. 
I got I'm trying to I got Garth to get back to or something, you know. And I guess Harry Fox can help if, if yeah. people go through Harry Fox. You can go on there and do your own yeah. license right. and just do it from your end. Then it it gets covered. So that that can happen. Some yeah, yeah, I think that's right. But yeah, most publishers I don't think are going to call you back. No, just it's, it's not, not worth, worth the time. The time. Yeah. Maybe a quick explanation of Harry Fox. It's a small woodland creature. <laughs> and, uh, it's got her, got her on. It's got her. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if I can give a, a brief. Basically, they, they handle a lot of licensing for a lot of publishers. And then you can go to harryfox.com and, and, and like search for a song and, and kind of tell them what, your, what kind of use this is going to be, whether it's limited pressing or mechanicals or whatever, and kind of walk through that. Not be on the artist side. I have limited experience with that. But they do represent a lot of songs. And yep. so if you're in that situation where you're trying to get a license and a publisher's not calling you back or you hadn't thought about that even and you want to do it right, check with Harry Fox. Yeah. It might be represented. Don't try to get anybody on the phone. Yeah. No. And the publishers it, might actually right. just send you to Harry Fox also. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah if they're represented by Harry Fox. Yeah. So you can yeah. go there and check, see if that song's in there, and walk through the process to go ahead and do some of that licensing yeah. yourself. You don't have to wait for if, that call If you back. want to get a compulsory license for a cover like you alluded to earlier, mm-hmm. a lot of that will be done through Harry Fox. Yeah. Okay. Not going to work for it's a brand new. Hey, I heard this writer play this song, right. the Bluebird. I want to be the first one to cut it on my right. independent record. That ain't going to work. Right, right. But, but for covers, for a cover song, yeah, yeah. So that leads us like right into you know what's being changed, right? And yeah. the the I think the big question on a lot of people's minds is going to be what's in that Music Modernization Act? What does it mean for indie artists and songwriters and creatives and um, What's your take on that from a legal angle? It was interesting because I was on a panel about this, and it was me and a, a guy from a major publisher and an independent songwriter and artist. And the publisher was completely in favor of this. Mm-hmm. The songwriter artist was completely against it, and then there was me somewhere in the middle. Right. Uh, <laughs> it was like it was like Goldilocks. Yeah. Um, which is where a lawyer should be. No, yeah, I mean, generally, in the middle. Yeah, generally, <laughs> generally, that's right. I mean, you know, we're we're trained to see both sides of things. So, um, yeah, I think it is it is a step in the right direction. And and we were talking about you know going from A to Z earlier. And if the goal was to get to Z, we're not there yet, but we're not at A anymore. Right. And and so this is moving the needle. And it's kind of a rare moment where. Almost everybody in the music industry agreed on this, mm-hmm. and you know, agreed about its necessity. And except that, for that one songwriter, that was, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's that right. Guy. Except for except for the one. Yeah. yeah, and there are some flaws in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's certainly not perfect. I have some uh, some concerns about a couple things in it, and and how they're going to play out. And uh, you know, as with all new things, it's going to take some time to see how it parses out. But you said something a minute ago, Johnny, about you know the process of uploading to YouTube and kind of the data that's there and figuring out who who are the songwriters and who are the owners and how are they going to get paid. And one of the things that the Music Modernization Act does is it creates a database of song owners and mm-hmm. authors, and that doesn't really exist right now. If you want to find out this information, you know you got to go. Look through BMR, BMI's repertory and, and ASCAPs and CSACs and you know try to figure this out. And so yeah, there, and that's just in the U.S. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. yeah, so um, so there will be a, a now a central database with this information that should assist in mm-hmm. getting everybody paid. And yeah, that's one of the things I understood about Spotify and some of those places. They were just sending these bulk. Uh, hey, we're trying to find out who the owners are these songs yeah. and they just dump it in this this repository or whatever yeah. I can't remember what the name of it it's is a no, it's the notice of intention thank you yeah, yeah. and going we know here's our notice that we intend to pay these people whoever mm-hmm. they are and they just let it sit there but it's this huge haystack yeah and to find your song in there or whatever and so people just weren't getting oh, paid yeah. Yeah. this mm-hmm. kind of removes that yeah it's Spotify Amazon Apple you know Google it's all basically a loophole there. yeah they're just dropping in just thousands daily and they're you know technically complying with the law the, the, you know 
there there have been some lawsuits about whether they are technically complying with the law. Mm-hmm. Um, no, because the money's not going into account. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're like, uh, and, well, <laughs> we in, but we don't know who you are. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Exactly. That's, exactly. It's not like they're that's sequestering the money until right. somebody finds it. Like, right. Yeah, so, well, so that's, that's that. That's probably what the lawsuits are like. Hey, <laughs> not even holding it back. Well, right? but, uh, yeah, and, and, and the lawsuit was. Um, are there there have been several, but I think they're generally about. Um, I mean, yeah, basically about these digital service providers just not paying mechanical royalties right. and there was actually some question about whether they really even had to pay mechanical royalties and then I think everybody more or less agreed yeah they should mm-hmm. and so th- that's one of the things this this law clears up also is that yeah you know mechanical royalties need to be paid and then it streamlines the way that they're going to be paid so rather than dumping a bunch of notice of intentions into the copyright office where they're just going to go into the ether mm-hmm. and nobody's going to find them but it's technical compliance there's now this database. There, there's a music licensing collective mm-hmm. that's going to be paid for by the digital service providers, but, but it's run gonna, by yeah, run by the publishers and independent songwriters. Mm-hmm. So there's a very specific makeup of who's going to be on the board of this collective to make sure that major publishers are represented, independent publishers are represented. And the fox isn't looking after the chicken coop. Yeah, 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 exactly. So let's just talk about the significance of that for a second, Um, because I think we need to clarify mechanical royalty. First of all, we need to clarify that it's been the same way for decades. Mm -hmm. Decades and decades and decades and decades. And the two main ways that music was really getting out was physical sales, Mm -hmm. um, radio, Mm -hmm. and TV. That was it. Right. Yep. And you know, or movies, or sync, or whatever. Yeah. But, but it had never changed. And then now we have this massive paradigm shift in the industry, and uh, the internet's born. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize that. And this is one of the things we preach on this show: is that while the rest of the world had to deal with the disruption of the internet to their business models immediately after Mm -hmm. it came out, the music industry didn't. Uh, We were still kind of protected for a couple of like two decades until mm-hmm. Spotify came out in 2009 mm-hmm. and wasn't available in America until 2011. So now seven years later, we're really just starting to hit the, the sort of bell curve where it just shoots up like a hockey stick mm-hmm. in regards to the, uh, to the, the masses embracing yeah. this as the way to do it. So on one hand, if we had been quick, as, as quick as everybody would like us, the government to be, which never happens, right, but right, like yeah, on the, on some kind that. of modern thing, we'd have had all this damn legislation for downloads, which are now becoming a dinosaur, right? Right. Exactly. right? Now and now we're on a streaming. Uh, but mechanical license, like way back in some, I don't know if it was in the 30s or 40s. Don't quote me on the on the time, but there was a backroom deal done by the conglomerate of radio station owners with Congress that basically said, hey, we're going to generate all this revenue playing this intellectual property that we don't own, Mm -hmm. okay? And we don't want to pay for all of it. (laughs) It's basically what it was. So every time you hear a song on the radio, guys, that's called performance royalty, okay? Mm -hmm. And the writers in the United States get paid. But if, um, you know, Sheryl Crow did, for instance, a cover of Sweet Child of Mine, uh, Cheryl, you know, the writers of Sweet Child of Mine, Guns N' Roses, get paid for that performance, mm-hmm. but Cheryl does not. And neither does her label. And neither does right. her label, because uh, even though they paid the money to get it out there, even though they've created a brand new work that's generating brand new revenue, mm-hmm. they're not getting any nod from that. Now, it's not that way over in Europe. And for those of you that are unaware of this, you should know this. So that's called the mechanical royalty. That's when, that's that's the... When well, the, no... That's, that's not the mechanical royalty. The, the, what, when what it's royalty played on the radio, it's a public performance royalty. Right. So it's a, well, what's the, the differentiation? Royalty, what's, the, what's the language between the differentiation the of who wrote royalty. it and who sang it, if, if they sing a new song? So think, think about it this way. When you, have a, when you have a copyright interest in a song, you have a bundle of rights, or sometimes the metaphor is a bundle of sticks. So you have certain things that are exclusively your rights. So you have the exclusive right to reproduction, you have the exclusive right to public performance, or in the case of a visual work, public display. You have the exclusive right to create a, a derivative works, so it's a, you know, write the new song, or mm-hmm. you know, if you're a playwright, to create the movie from that, or, or, or something like that. Um, and, um, and then there's a couple others, but those are you know, kind of the, the key ones. And so what we're really talking about here are the rights to reproduction and the rights of public performance. And the mechanical 
license has to do with the right to reproduction because mm -hmm. so CDs, vinyl. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you know originally it was Apple an actual Alabama. mechanical reproduction of the music. Right, right. It's like right. a machine. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, oh, that makes sense. So the mechanical yeah. right is. Is yeah, it's essentially the right of reproduction to um, you know for vinyl or CDs um, eight or tracks. downloads. Yeah, eight yeah, tracks. Download, yeah. Paid downloads like yeah. iTunes. Um, it, when it's on the radio, it's a public performance, mm. um, just like it is when an artist plays it live. Mm. Um, and there's other types of public performance too, but you know those are those are the big ones. Yeah. So um, the public performance right is actually the one where. In the U.S., there is no public performance right on terrestrial radio for the masters. So that's where Sheryl Crow's label does not get paid, she does not get paid, but Guns N' Roses' publisher does. Right. So that's the... That's the and, well, this is the point right. I want to make, so I'm using the wrong language, and I'm glad that we cleared that up. But, you know, that never was the case in Europe, but because... So Sheryl Crow doing Sweet Child of Mine and it being a public performance played over terrestrial radio in Europe, uh, technically, if she was European, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Guns N' Roses would be paid as the writers and she would be paid uh, a piece of that revenue. As the artist. Yep. As the artist. But uh, we have a reciprocal agreement with uh, Europe because Europe's like, well, if you're not going to pay our European artists in America for, mm -hmm. for the... Uh, you know, for the public performance, if even if they didn't write it, then right. we're not going to pay them over here. And we're going to if line. you're not going to pay the Beatles, except they, you know, for doing a cover. Yeah. Then we're not going to pay Cheryl Crow for doing a cover. That's right. That's right. So it's not reciprocal. It's like screw you too. My point in telling you this is number one, I want to make you aware of that, but number two is that you know, Pandora, Spotify, all these all these digital streaming services, Amazon, they have to pay both. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And they actually yeah. do a lot better, from my understanding, on the artist royalties than they do on on publishing. Now this is before the MMA, but I've I've heard some writers who also do like background vocals and stuff. Going, I've made more money off like Pandora and those streaming things as a background vocalist than I have off as a songwriter. That's now, crazy. <laughs> I should clarify that the Music Modernization Act doesn't really change any of that. This is all that's that all goes through Sound Exchange. Right. And the Music Modernization Act, this new music licensing collective, is just for mechanical royalties. So when when there's a song that's played the stream, there's still the public performance royalty. That gets paid through the PROs, just like it does when it's on the radio through BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, GMR. Um, but then there's this mechanical royalty because... You know, again, we're kind of fitting round pegs and square holes here yeah, with new, new technology. And streaming, there's not a new widget produced it, well, that I take with so me. There's physically, not, not, right. it's not so, atoms, it's bits, right? It, right, right. And there is a, there, there's technically a copy made um, when something is streamed. And then, of course, there's limited downloads that happen on these DSPs. So the courts for, you know, basically the last 20 years have been trying to figure out, well, how does this technology that did not exist in... 1976 when the Copyright Act was written, how does it fit into that act? Mm -hmm. And so what this does is it sort of patches one of those holes when it comes to mechanical licenses and the idea that when um, when someone is streaming music on Spotify or Apple Music or um, Amazon or whatever it is, that yeah, there's this public performance royalty because it's going out and it's it's being played just like it does on the radio or just like it does on Pandora or just like it does on Sirius XM. But then there's also this mechanical right to reproduction that should be paid. And so this there's now a blanket license that these DSPs are going to pay that is very similar to uh, the way the blanket license works for public performance royalties or you know, every every venue, for example, is paying a blanket license to BMI and ASCAP and the other PROs so that they don't have to, you know, keep track detailed of track of everything that's played there. Mm -hmm. And then the PROs dish that out to the songwriters. Mm -hmm. um, the is, PROs screw the songwriters as they see fit. <laughs> <laughs> they have their own secret sauce recipe That's of how that saw. gets uh, yeah. divvied what's up. What's a primary right? vocal and yeah. what's a secondary vocal? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so the idea here is that this music licensing collective will 
collect all the money. It'll be run by the publishers and the songwriters, and then it will distribute that money that comes from Spotify and Apple and Amazon, etc. But bottom line is Apple and all the, the the DSPs, the digital service providers, are now ha- having to pay more. That's right. right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And there's also there's there's new standards on how uh, compulsory license rates are are going to be. Um, are going to be figured out, which is more going to be more ad- advantageous to songwriters. So the whole process is going to be more efficient. It should be more money for songwriters, and more people should be getting paid. And by the way, like when you talk about something as, as sophisticated as storing that kind of data, like 20 years from now, mm-hmm. there's going to be so much data in there that it's really going to make it a lot easier to make sure all the money's getting to the right yeah. places. And, and speaking of data, a really important point for songwriters is going to be this database. And you need to register your copyright to, to be, be in that yeah, database. Yeah. And what's going to happen, so this is one of the areas that I think is flawed in this law, is if there are unclaimed royalties, they're going to sit in a pot for three years. And then after three years, those unclaimed royalties are going to be distributed to the publishers based on market share. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen is if you're an independent songwriter and you haven't registered and you're not in this database, you're not going to be able to claim your royalties. And then you, who needs them most, is mm-hmm. going to lose out on those royalties and they're going to go after three years to the major publishers. Who because they the have the least. major market share. Yeah. Now, can they do it after the fact? Before the three years is up, I think so, because that would be fair. It'd be I retroactive so. to the first. Yeah, of the three yeah. Years. yeah but after yeah. three years, that money's gone. Okay. Yeah. So see, that's that's good to know. So I mean, you know what? You still got to dot your eyes and cross your teeth. Yeah, exactly. Like, you can't walk on stage and pretend yeah. you're the greatest guitar player yeah. in the world and forget that. Hey, I just forgot to tune it. I just don't yeah. think like that. Like it doesn't <laughs> work. It's gonna sound like crap. Yeah. It's the same thing. You got to take care of business. Yeah. And this is a compulsory license, just like the cover license. So you mm-hmm. can't you can't stop the digital service providers from playing your song and making it available. But they but do they, have to pay. They do have to pay you, but then there's conditions on that or you, you know, you get right. the copyright. But register. you have to make yourself payable. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's so you have to go through the copyright office to get on that list or is that still kind of up in the air to be so, figured out? Uh, you, you have to register your copyright to take advantage of any compulsory license, even the cover license. If your copyright's not, not registered, you're mm-hmm. probably not going to um, not going to get paid for that. Um, I don't think there is a separate registration for the database. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to come from the copyright office's records, but I don't recall the details of that point. And we have a little bit of time to figure this out because yeah. it's not all, it's law, but it's not all in effect yet. So yeah, yeah right. I mean, these things take time to implement. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, they've got to put together the the licensing collective and mm-hmm. the board and the various committees of all this stuff. Yeah. It's going to be a work. In and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the, um, the, the, the other piece of that is that it still, still hasn't settled down completely yet, you know, yeah. um, as to where, w- what's the ubiquitous consumption method yeah. that we're going to use yeah. for this, you know? And so the more that becomes clear, it clearly looks like it's going to be streaming, but mm-hmm. The, the the easier it is going to be to, to get, to refine the law, right, yeah. and, to, and to make it better. So um, we're running a little bit long here, but I think this is good because we've got the lawyer. And he gets paid by the hour, so um, he, he's okay it. with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, somebody had asked about show contracts, uh, specifically live show contracts, which I answered, and I got, did I get your stamp of approval on my answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. It's on the climb, so... Then. Um, you should go there. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. you know, with contracts, I mean, there's no, there's never a complete one size fits all. There are s- sort of standards and customs and you know, kind of zones in which, um, you know, if you ask for X, you may be way outside the norm, and that's probably not advisable. Uh, but with most things, you know, if you're kind of in that zone, you'll be fine. And so, yeah, I agree with Johnny that you know, fifty percent up front is pretty standard, and then. Um, you know, 50%, uh, you know, at the time of the show. And, you know, if you, if you can, you should get it before you play, but you know, that depends on your, you know, your leverage with the, uh, with the promoter and yeah. you know, how much leverage you've created in the music business. If and it's will. different for every venue too. I mean, not for nothing. Like I learned the hard way like when you first go into a club, when you're on tour and uh-huh. you're out there and you need that money to get to the next town, 
go look at the beer coolers, man. <laughs> if they're not full, if they can't afford money to replace the beer that they sold last night, you're probably not going to get paid. Mm. <laughs> so it's a little litmus test, like, okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. yeah with, is, with every contract, you still got to be able to enforce it. So you still got to learn <laughs> kind of the real world uh, That's right. ways yeah. to deal with people. So um, somebody had asked about the role in attorneys pitching artists to labels. Like, what's that about? Um, I mean, yeah, that's traditionally been the case in the music business. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly how that got started, uh, except that, you know, attorneys essentially just developed a... A, a relationship. Kind of, yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. A, a trust that labels had that, you know, attorneys weren't going to bring a, them... They're a filter. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think it's, you know, in part a function of... You know, the way the team in the music industry works where, you know, if you think about, um, you know, Ari Gold from Entourage and you think about what a, what a film and TV agent does, they're kind of the, the centerpiece of the team for uh, film and TV talent. Um, but, you know, in the music industry, the agents are really kind of, they play a very specific role. It's, it's booking and, um, you know, sponsorships and things like that. So then you have, you know, the managers that have a more general role and the attorney that has a more general role and and they tend to kind of be the gatekeepers. Um, That said, there is still some of that in the industry today, but it's not quite the same as it used to be because not everybody needs to go through a label. And I think the bottom line is if a label gets something from someone that they trust, whether that is an artist manager or a business manager or an agent or a you know publicist or an attorney or, or whomever, if it's somebody that they know and trust, they're going to listen to it. But you know, as everybody hopefully knows by now, if you send a demo unsolicited to anyone, frankly, it's going to go directly in the trash. Yeah, because yeah. there's a better chance of then a lawyer getting involved <laughs> than <laughs> of finding the hit song. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, it's it's focus on the audience, man. That's the key here. Focus on the audience. I mean, Bad Baby, nobody ever thought she was a rapper, but mm-hmm. she got a guaranteed two-record deal from Atlantic. You know, why? She's got 11 million followers on Instagram, yeah. okay? Now, how she got it doesn't matter. She has an audience, yeah. and you can like it or hate it, but it's what you need to focus on. If you, The more audience that you have, the bigger audience that you have, the more easier these questions become yeah and uh the more you can afford to hang out with uh with a lawyer like jeremy and <laughs> yeah. get some real answers it's, it's funny i was i was talking to a publisher this morning and he you know we were talking about this stuff he's like man that the a and a and r these days stands for analytics mm-hmm. yeah. you know, instead of artists and repertoire it's like analytics yeah i mean everybody wants so much to buy that. an existing thriving business yeah, you know they don't want to put the time into developing an artist and a songwriter. I can't not, afford not to. Not if one is available. Not yeah, if a right. business is available. Why? Right. And you can't afford to. I mm-hmm. mean, just I mean, like to, to, I, I always say this. Tom Petty's "Damn the Torpedoes" came out in '79, I think, and that was eight dollars and ninety nine cents. Mm-hmm. Put that into an inflationary calculator. It's right <laughs> around thirty bucks today. Mm-hmm. And his latest record that he put out, "Hit Hit Hit Not a Guy Before He Passed Away." Is on sale like everybody else is on iTunes for ten ninety nine, so yeah. that's a sixty six percent drop. So just imagine at your own job if you know you're used to sort of you know doing this development or that development, and you lost you know sixty six percent of your paycheck, and also we're only allowed to work ten percent of the hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, How, you know they don't have the money right to, to develop them anymore. They can't afford that kind of stake, mm-hmm. and it's it's it. It seems a little crappy because now you've got to do more work, but the good news is you don't have to ask create art by two different publicly traded committees. Yeah, you don't have to ask permission yeah. to get your art out there. That's right. Yeah. Bad Baby didn't ask permission. <laughs> no, because she is a bad baby. You know? I and I mean, you see an artist right. like you know Granger Smith, you're seeing artists like Cody Johnson. She didn't say, may I please go outside. She's right. like, no, yeah. cash me outside. Follow me. I, I will tell I, you. Cash me outside. <laughs> How about that? That's what she said. Right. And they said, we'll cash you outside with a record deal. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of people that want to hear what you got to say. Um, and then the last thing, we'll, we'll cover this up real quick. Um, really is, is what's being done to address the... the uh, the, the streaming host reaping all the money and not, you know, fairly compensating the artists. And, I, man, you and I have had a lot of talks about this, Jeremy. You know, Brett and I have talked about it a lot. This is where the capitalistic free market works. Okay, mm-hmm. just let, just watch what happens. We've been talking about this for a while, about how 
when somebody like Taylor Swift goes and drops a record, Spotify's going to get a billion hits, a billion streams in one month, that first month, a billion. And if let's say they're generating, let's say like 34 cents, and I got a reason to say that, okay, but, but I don't want to get into that in the podcast, but let's say they're generating 34 cents a stream in revenue. That means they're going to generate in one month $340 million of revenue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just look in the history, and if we can all agree here that the that the definition of a customer is the person or the business entity that pays the creator of a product or service directly for that product or service, mm -hmm. here's the trick question: Who's always been the customer of the record labels since they were for for a hundred years since they were invented? It was never the consumer. It's the retail right. source. It's, it's store. the retail yeah. source. It's the distributors. Yeah. They got paid from Target. They got paid from Walmart. They mm -hmm. got paid from Best Buy. They got paid from Musicland, Sam Goody, all those stores. That's who paid the record labels, not you. You paid the distributor. Mm -hmm. So they've, it's never been in the DNA of the corporate brand of any of these record companies to know who you are. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, Spotify always joke about it is kind of like the Don King of the record industry, right? They found this like really awesome boxer with a lot of talent. It's kind of ignorant about what's going on right now in the real world. And we're just going to go put them out there, give them a Cadillac and $50,000 in cash and make all this money, you know? And, uh, but it won't be long before you start to see the crack show. And, but it's a huge corporate jump. And this isn't like me slamming the labels. It's a massive corporate jump to go from being a record label to thinking like Amazon mm. and understanding the specifics of e-commerce and knowing the power of that data and who it is and then who, who the hell's going to run it and how do you run it like yeah. even if they knew that's what they got to do like how do you do it and who do you hire like it's crazy mm -hmm. but we've already seen that happen with that latest article that came out with with Universal now is like flirting with hosting some of their intellectual property yeah and saying, hey, if we're generating all the traffic that's creating all this revenue mm -hmm. that makes a company like Spotify go public, mm -hmm. yeah. why shouldn't we take all the money and Spotify can be a service? Well, it's kind of like uh, Disney's going to be doing that's a exactly streaming what I service, was about. right? Yeah. So compete with Netflix, Warner Brothers, yep. uh, DC Entertainment, who does you know Superman, Batman. They have their own streaming service, which just launched. So they're going, hey, wait a second. Why? We don't have to just be content creators. We can distribute it ourselves right. and get our own subscription. And, and generate all the revenue from the And they're the doing a subscription, yeah. too, which is interesting, which may be something as well. But, yeah, they're doing their own stuff. Disney's like, we don't have to go through Netflix. We don't have to go through. Let's just go by Fox and, and then maybe, you know, what all comes with that? We're buying all this content and let's put it out ourselves on Disney streaming. And So what does this yeah. mean in the end? So, like, big picture stuff, guys. This is really big picture stuff. But what's And this is, by the way, this is the way it's going to shake out. Not because I'm a genius. Not because I got a crystal ball. Because every other freaking industry on the planet ended up, for the most part, with the creators of the product or service doing business directly with the end users. Like, what happened to the airlines? Mm -hmm. Used to have a travel agent in every faded map dot in the country. And now we all just go on hot, you know cheap tickets or yeah. hot, hot or prices, whatever. travel velocity. By the way, yeah. all different brand names, all owned by the yeah. airlines. You're Tesla's doing business selling cars directly to yep. consumers. That's right. Yeah. You know, uh, what's that? Car Carvana. Uh, and yeah. most people don't know this, but all your mostly used to be franchise dealerships, car dealerships, not all of them, but most of them owned wholly. Now they were bought back by the... By the car company. So the car manufacturers are doing business direct with the end user. Uh, and the same thing with computers. You know, it used to be CompUSA and you get your computer. At, you can still get them. You get the crap stuff at Best Buy and, and Walmart. But if you want the good Dell computer, if you want the good Apple, you're getting it directly from Apple or directly from Dell. Mm -hmm. So this is what's going to happen in the music industry. This is good because ultimately what the value that Spotify is bringing to this, first of all, showing people it can be done yeah. and how to do it. Secondly, we're going to copy it, and we got the intellectual property. And unlike Netflix, if you think about it, which started out being that, but then became now they're content a content as provider. Well. Yeah, yes. a content creator. Uh, so far, Spotify said, to my knowledge, that they have no intention of doing that, which I find silly. And uh, I don't know how they they might change their mind if the content goes away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that's right. I, I mean, what they do have is some really cool ones and zeros that allow people to keep their your playlist in order and all that. So they're like mm -hmm. this aggregator, this sort of service that can have now, once the intellectual, when, once the biggies in the intellectual property me. take the power back and say, we're going to make all the money because we're creating the traffic, mm -hmm. 
that's a win for the indie artist. Because then you're going to be able to get on different servers where you're going to get paid a lot more than Spotify got paid you for somebody to handle your stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And to, to get you in that ball game. But you're going to get a, a little bit more of that revenue that's created. That's just, it's what's going to end up happening. It, it can't not happen that way. You yeah. Know? So, I agree. Anyway, guys, Jeremy, thank you so much for taking yeah, the time. Thank man. you, guys. Enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, where can they reach out to you? If somebody needs some legal help, I mean, Jeremy can't tell you who he works with, but he works with like a lot of really big people uh, in the industry. Uh, he's your guy. Where can they reach you? Yeah, so my website is brooklawfirm.com. It's B R O O K, no E, no S, just brooklawfirm.com. You can email me at jeremy at brooklawfirm.com. There you go. All right, guys, well, it brings us to the end of uh, probably our longest episode ever, but it's really good because this is good stuff here. So uh, join the climb community if you haven't done it. Uh, just search for it. We let everybody in. Be good boys and girls. Subscribe to the podcast. Leave a five-star rating and review and share it. If you like this stuff, if this was helpful, please share it. And also, hey, comment back on the Climate Community and listen to what you thought of Jeremy. I'll leave that post up there for a little while longer, and, and hopefully we answered all your questions, guys, all right? This podcast exists because we want you to win, so keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. <laughs> <laughs>